No? Uh, yeah. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Denise Cole. Um, I uh, am responsible for uh, being a liaison for the social ministry uh, to council here at St. Matthew Lutheran Church. I'd like to welcome you all, and I would like to most especially welcome our guest, Brian Armstrong. Um, as a little bit of an introduction, God gives everybody a gift. And my gift, my sister says, is that I'm the friendliest person she's ever met. And I talk to everybody about everything. Well, I think God gave Brian that gift too. We met at the playground while his grandson, Mason, was playing with my daughter. And uh, one thing led to another, and he told me about, that he had written a book. Um, and uh, being neighborly, I said, oh, what's it about? And he told me. It's called uh, The Franklin Park Tragedy, A Forgotten Story of Racial Injustice in New Jersey. And this had come up, I'm not sure if it was before or after I started discussions about anti-racism here at St. Matthew Lutheran Church and leading our ministry um, for, for anti-racism. And so I said, hey, Brian, how do you feel about talking to our church? And he said, sure, I'd love to do that. And so here we are. Brian's come out of hiding after 18 months or so. This is his first uh, live discussion of his book. So um, without further ado, welcome. Well, welcome, everybody. This is exciting to me to finally have a live audience. I've done quite a few virtual presentations over the last year, but it's not the same. You're just kind of looking at a box, and you kind of, you kind of see a few chats, but it's nice to look at people's faces. Um, I'm very excited to be here and talk about this book because I, I spent about two years uh, working on it, and I'm going to give you the kind of the story behind it, and uh, it, uh, it, it's definitely uh, a, an interesting story. I'm going to start with a story about my family. Uh, my father um, was uh, in the Navy uh, in 1945, and uh, he was finished his basic training up at the Lake, uh, Great Lakes uh, Training Center, and uh, he decides to come back down to Chicago, and he goes to the Palmer House, and he wants to have dinner by himself, so, you know, have a nice fancy dinner after all this time. He sits down at a table. Next to him is a table of an African-American family sitting there, all dressed up like they'd possibly went to church or a family event. Everybody had their meal, and when the meal was over, uh, they paid their bill, and they left. And then about a couple minutes later, the maitre d' came out and smashed the dishes publicly in front of all the other diners. That was a racial injustice, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, another racial injustice. Why I wrote this book, it's kind of interesting. I kind of found the story by accident. Um, I was uh, doing some research for South River, where my family was from, and we had done not a very good job in the historical society on chronicling the African-American history of South River. So I went in the New Brunswick newspapers, and I was looking through, and I found this story. And I was like, first I'm like, there must be something written on it. It's so, such an interesting you know, kind of story. And as I looked in, there was nothing, and the stories that had kind of talked about it really had the thing all wrong. So I started researching it, and uh, it became this hidden event that I felt was really something that needed to be sh shared. The newspapers called the Franklin Park tragedy the murders that took place, but a big part of the tragedy was the events that happened later which was the expulsion of the African-American uh, residents from the area. And this is a relevant topic with everything that's going on today. Just a quick thing on Franklin Park, you know, because a lot of people probably aren't really aware of Franklin Park. It's a town south of uh, New Brunswick. Um, it, it, you know, back 125 years ago, it was pretty much divided between 85% uh, white and 15% black. Uh, today, it's a much more diverse uh, area, as you can see, where you have, you know, pretty much even distribution of, of people that live there, and it's a completely different community than it was 125 years ago. This is what I'm really going to be presenting tonight, is 10 reasons why I think that you should uh, read the book, and I, I hope that I can convince you. The first uh, reason is in the beginning part of the book, I talk about the murders and uh, the funeral that took place and then also kind of the other strange circumstances around the murder. Um, what happens is, there, to give you kind of a, an overview of, of what happens, there is uh, a supposed home invasion where two African-American men apparently come into a house and kill a mother and a daughter and the husband 
fights them off and kills them. Now that's the story that's in the media, but as we go along, we'll see what we think. This is kind of where it all took place. This road looks completely different today. It's a Claremont Road, and back then it was even had a tree in the middle of the road. So if you came down the road and you were navigating or your carriage around, you had to navigate around a tree. Now I can tell you, riding on this road today, because I've ridden down it a million times, there's always a car behind you. You can never drive slow on it. It's a very congested road. Uh, the, the Moore Baker house that you see up there, that's the house where the murders took place. Unfortunately, the house burned down in uh, 1980. I was kind of hoping that it still survives, but it, it's gone. This is what it looks like today. It's a completely different community. It's this, community is a $600,000 house is mostly owned by Indian families. And back then it was a 40 acre farm. This area that's in the wooded area in the front, that is where the, the, the murders took place. This is the house. From the beginning of my research on this, I just found this house incredibly mysterious and weird looking. And it was the picture that appeared in all of the newspapers when they were talking about the murders. And the room that's on the second floor right there, the bay window, that's where the murders took place in that room. And the, the two circles are the way the staircase was illuminated uh, as you would come up the stairs. These were the two victims, Lucretia Baker and her daughter Gertrude Baker, who was 15 months old. And this is kind of the layout of what happened. In the front door here, the supposed attackers were to, came in uh, one attacker had an ax and attacked the mother and the baby. The other attacker was supposedly f fought with the husband and then ran to the back room. And then the husband fought with the one attacker, got the ax away from him, killed him with the ax, and then grabbed the shotgun from the corner and shot the other attacker in the head. If that sounds complicated, it's a little complicated. <laughs> this is the survivor, Moore Baker. Uh, he was 22 years old. This is an illustration of him on the left. That's him around 1920 in the middle, and that's him as a, a man in his 80s. If you can see the bump on his side of the head, he claimed that's what he got fighting with Willard Thompson that night. Nope. Uh, this is after the murders uh, took place, um, and he, you know, uh, killed the two men, he fled the house. And if, one thing that makes this kind of unusual is it was 28 degrees outside. They had just had a blizzard, and so there was snow on the ground, and he went out in his nightshirt, totally covered with blood, because he had, had, when he killed the one man, blood went all over the place, and then he had a wound on his forehead as well. And so he hopped on the horse with just his bed shirt on and rode to the doctor's office. And this is the route that he took. And then this is the doctor's office, which miraculously still survives today. And so you can imagine Moore Baker coming up to that front door, all covered in blood, at 2 AM. And the doctor opens the door. And he does something that's kind of remarkable. Today, if uh, someone came to a doctor's door at 2 AM, covered in blood with a wound on his head, with kind of tra traumatic look on his face, he'd say, we're going to send you to the hospital. He says to him, get on your horse, and we're going back to the house. So Moore Baker gets on his horse, goes to his father's house first, and then gets changed into his brother's clothes, and then they go to the house. When they entered the house, uh, they came in through the front door and went up into the room, and Moore Baker's father uh, indicated that what he first saw was quite shocking. He went into the door, and he saw his uh, daughter-in-law on the bed, totally covered in blood, and then his grandchild face down in the crib, dead. He then also saw the two attackers, one attacker in the doorway and one that was in the back room who was still alive. And one of the things that kind of, I talk about in the book is the man that was still alive, nobody gave him any medical care. They basically let him sit there for about four hours and slowly die from a head wound. Um, this is uh, a view the next day, and what happened was is really bizarre. They let the word out that there is a, um, this murder took place, and hundreds of people come to the house. And so they're all, you know, their carriages and their horses, and they're all there, and they want to see the crime scene. And so they actually come in through the front door, and they come in there, and hundreds of people walk in and view this poor woman murdered on the bed and the baby in the crib. 
If this wasn't a compromised crime scene, I don't know what was. And so they tell the coroner, this coroner must have been the laziest coroner in the world. He does not arrive until 10 a.m. the next day. And at that time, he and the physician analyze all the bodies, and then they have an inquest. So the inquest is held. The only two people that testify is Moore Baker and the doctor, Dr. Hoagland. Now, by the way, Dr. Hoagland was also Moore Baker's hunting buddy. So they're the only two people that testify in the, in the case. Moore Baker says that he thinks the motive for it is that he had showed a $100 bill to one of the attackers the day before, and he believes that what they wanted to do was to break in the house and get the $100 bill. Uh, one of the bizarre instances that happened that night was the two men had a carriage that rode to Dayton, which is about three miles away, in the 28 degree weather that was Moore Baker's carriage. And the question was, why did he have it? And Moore Baker said, they took it from me. They weren't supposed to be in it. So anyway, the, the plot supposedly was that they were going to kill the family, take the money, and then burn the house. Uh, Willard Thompson is the one that actually killed supposedly two people. And Henry Baker had gone to the back door, or back room. But what happened was he's considered the mastermind behind it. So he's just as guilty as Willard Thompson. Dr. Hogan testifies. The inquest result is in 15 minutes, they decide that the two men uh, that are dead uh, are guilty of homicide, and that Moore Baker uh, had justified homicide, and he is released. They take the two bodies, they're in the room, and men wanted to throw them out the window, but the coroner said, no, we can't do that, that's disrespect for the bodies. So they put them outside in the snow, and then a little while later, they threw them into the road, kind of like roadkill, the two killers, supposed killers. So then they notify the almshouse to come and get the bodies. In the meantime, the men uh, from around that area, those hundreds of men, decided they wanted to burn the bodies. And if anybody knows anything about lynching, there's a process of hanging and then burning. And so because there wasn't a body to hang, they wanted to burn the body. So luckily, the individual from the almshouse comes is able to collect the bodies quick enough, puts them into the carriage, and the men actually chase him as he's riding away with the bodies trying to bring them for burial. This is where the almshouse ex uh, existed. This is something that came to my attention after I'd written the book. And one of the things, this whole book was written primarily using newspaper archives as, as a research for it. There weren't a lot of primary sources. But this came up afterwards, and this is actually a diary entry that talks about the events that took place. And what it says is, went to the funeral for Mrs. Moore Baker and child who were killed March 1st by two colored burglars, Thompson and Baker. It was a very large funeral. People coming from great distance and roads were very bad. Um, this funeral was like the biggest event you can imagine. It was a very rural community. Thousands of people came to this, and it was, uh, and a lot of it had to do with the whole racial undertones of what was going on. And so that was why all the farmers in the area and everybody in the area came. This is the area that it w that's along Route 27 in New Brunswick, and that's the Six Mile Run Church. And this is kind of what it looked like. This is from the, around the turn of the century. But can you imagine this place clogged with horses, carriages, and everybody, and it's all snow and ice on the ground. It was a complete mess. They had a hard time actually getting bringing the bodies to the church. This is the church. This church looks almost identical to the way it looked 125 years ago. And this is a, a, a show of, of what it was like to bring the coffin in to the front of the church. Normally, they would bring the coffin in through the side, but because it was a double casket, mother and child, they had to bring it in through the front door. And so this is them bringing it in through the front door. This is a, sh a picture of the church around the time of when the uh, funeral was. This church, if you go there today, looks almost identical to this. The only difference is there's an organ in the back. It's really an incredible uh, you know, building as far as preservation. So what they would do is they, bring the, they brought the casket in and they put it right there in the front in front of the altar. And, so, and it was an open casket. Uh, this is an illustration up here on the top of what the casket looked like with the mother and child in the casket. 
And this on the bottom is actually the roads of what they look like at that time. This was, someone actually gave me a glass print that they had, and so that's actually an authentic picture of what it looked like. When the service was over, they brought the bodies to the cemetery, which was about a mile away. The next day, things get real weird. Uh, this wax museum in New York, the Eden Musee, sends a representative out to Moore Baker and says, we want to buy everything in the house that's associated with the murders, and we want to recreate the whole scene in New York City in a museum. And Moore Baker says, sure. And he sells all the belongings of things that had his kid's blood on it and his wife's blood and everything, and they cart it away. And they rebuild this whole scene in the museum in New York. This museum was like one of the most popular uh, museums in New York at the time. It was, at, but the second uh, popularity after the Statue of Liberty. It was that famous. I went online and I actually was able to buy the catalog from that year. And this is a description of it. Um, you know, and the reason why they wanted this in the museum was again, this whole idea of creating this racial issue about the evil uh, attackers attacking a family, killing the child, and, the, and then the husband using frontier justice. That was the whole reason for them doing it. So Moore Baker, suddenly uh, he, there's a change in feeling on him. He was so popular initially that when I went out and looked at newspapers, I found hundreds of newspapers that mentioned this story, some of them in New Zealand, in England, any English-speaking country. I would imagine they probably were in foreign countries as well, but I couldn't read them. But uh, he was this, like, superstar. And then suddenly, after he sells the stuff to the museum, his, his star seems to tarnish a little bit, and people think he's a little strange. So then he goes and has an auction and sells off all the belongings, including his wife's precious uh, piano, her, her, her wedding ring, everything, and then leaves town. A year later, he comes back to town, and he's coming back from New Brunswick, and he's attacked on the bridge coming in there. And people felt it was the Thompson and, the, and Baker family, uh, the families of the two attackers, that were getting revenge against him. The interesting thing is that they had alibis that night for, you know, that they were supposedly doing something else. And the only people that could give an alibi at that time was pr probably somebody, a white family in the neighborhood that did it. So there, you, this shows that there were certain groups within the town that didn't follow and believe this story. So Moore Baker went and married again. Uh, he was involved in lawsuits. But one of the strangest things happens in 1903. In Philadelphia, a newspaper comes out and says that Moore Baker was confessing on his deathbed that he had killed his wife and daughter and the two men. And um, this story was sold out. All the newsstands bought, everybody bought it. It was like this massive thing. And then it came out that it was fake news. He was still alive and he said that he didn't say it. But the fact that it was printed creates a sense that there was a doubt within the public about his version of, of what happened. He dies at the 83 and there's no mention of the Franklin Park tragedy in his obituary. Now here's something that's kind of an important thing that I learned when I researched this book is just the whole story about New Jersey slavery. And the more you read about it, it it's, it's just very uh, troubling. Uh, the first thing is, is that in this particular area, when we're talking about the people involved here, most of the people that are white there were prior slaveholders, their families, and the people that are working for them that were the field workers were the descendants of slaves. And in New Jersey, it was a gradual abolition that went on from 1804 to 1846. And what would happen is if you were, if a slave had a child, they'd had to wait till they were like 21, 18 or 21 to be, get their freedom. And oftentimes then masters would also free them in their wills when they died. So it happened over a very sh long period of time that it took. And most of the black residents in Franklin Park in 1894 were descendants from slaves. And this is something that really kind of, that I just wasn't aware of is that when you think of people that lived at that point, most of them were born in New Jersey, and there was not a lot of movement allowed even after people got freedom. And it wasn't really until the Great Migration that people started to go places. And so that, that is when the population became more diverse and you had people from Georgia and Virginia and other places. But at this time, if you go in the census records, which I did a lot of analysis of, everybody was born in New Jersey. 
This is the first sign as I was going through the newspapers that something else was going on here. And this is a thing that came out a month later and it said that basically this group had been established, a vigilante group in Franklin Park, and they were forcing all of the African American uh, citizens to leave. Some of these people had been in there, living there for generations and they were told that they had to get out by Saturday. Um, the notices went up in the, in the different stores and other places in town. This is, um, well, actually, I'm just going to talk about first what, why the expulsion happened. Maggie Miggins, the mother of Henry Baker, one of the alleged attackers, she confronted the farmers, which was pretty tough thing to do back in those days. And she went, and there was a group of farmers, and she said, my son and, and Willard Thompson did not kill anybody. Now, this is very significant because her son, uh, from what Moore Baker said, didn't kill anybody. But Willard Thompson was supposedly killed the mother and the daughter. So she did not believe that, that he had killed, that either of them had killed anybody. And then other black residents also resisted the version that Moore Baker had said. And so what happens is they put these notices up in the store and other places in town. They're prim primarily up for the white residents because a lot of the black residents could not read and write. So they were trying to kind of force a community effort to get to all the people pushed out. And what I found as I researched this, they had done the same thing 12 years earlier. And uh, I actually went back and looked at the census records and you could see after the previous expulsion, the fewer number of African-American citizens in the town. And this was a textbook expulsion. It starts out with a real or perceived crime, overreaction to the community, notification to leave, intimidation, threat or act of lynching, sundown designation. The only thing that didn't happen here was property rights were respected. There were several uh, African-American families that owned land, and they did land, their land wasn't taken from them, but within 10 years, all of those families had left, uh, and their descendants chose not to stay there after the person who owned the house died. So there was a feeling that it, they weren't welcome. This one group in town resisted it, the Aid and Detective Society. They were kind of like the police force at the time that fought horse thieves and chicken thieves, and they did not agree with what this group, the Mutual Endeavor Society, was doing. And so they actually took steps to undermine their activities to try to stop the expulsion. The Suntown eventually designation happened for a portion of the town, and the portion is the area around the church going towards Pleasant Plains. And this Sundown Town designation meant basically that people could come in there and work, but at the end of the day, they had to go live somewhere else. And they forced people to live in the communities that surrounded Franklin Park, but they would not allow them to live there. Uh, the media at the time, this is one of the things that was just really incredible to me, the, the, the racist nature of the media. Different newspapers had different political affiliations. The one newspaper, the New Brunswick Times, was definitely more uh, aligned to the Democratic Party, which at that time was more the Southern Party. And uh, they, had, they would use the word Negro in, as a noun and as a verb. If it was a noun, it was always Negro, um, uh, fiendish Negro, awful Negro, terrible Negro. If it was a pronoun, it was Negro rapist, Negro murderer, Negro uh, villain. It was always a negative thing. I actually went and searched to try to see if I could find any positive things, and I found very few mentions ever of any kind of positive things in the newspaper. The lynching news coverage was just shocking to me. As I went through the newspapers and reviewed them, they would put these stories about lynching in the newspaper without any condemnation of, from all over the country, and it was kind of just put there in the newspaper for people to absorb. The Brunswick Times uh, editorial came out and said, the best way to stop lynching is to not commit lynching offenses. And um, they had one, there's a very prominent man that lived in Franklin Park, uh, Cato Hoagland. He owned a house and he, was a, you know, he had uh, saved quite a bit of money and owned a farm. And he had a tenant, this guy Cornell, that came to stay with him. And the newspaper said, a white man named Cornell has moved to Clyde Station to, to live in this place, is living with Cato Hoagland, a colored man. Circumstances have made him colorblind and his tastes seem in need of repair. 
And so these are some of the things that you found in the newspaper at that time. <clears throat> One of the things I did in this book was I went and read all kinds of books about Franklin Park, and I was just shocked how there was absolutely no profiles of prominent African Americans that lived back at this time in the 1800s. <clears throat> so what I did was I looked at maps and other things, and I decided I selected a few of the people that are very, were very important, and I include profiles of them in the book. And um, someone like, uh, for instance, Cato Hoagland, he had actually worked in New York City, saved money, and then came out there and bought a farm. And so I kind of pieced together different aspects of his life through uh, different information that I found and put that in there. This up individual on the bottom here is Aaron Hush. He was a Civil War veteran. He wanted to join up, and New Jersey did not allow African Americans to fight in their troops. So he had to go to Pennsylvania, and actually that's where he served. Um, but he's a very a prominent uh, a participant of the Civil War. One of the things uh, that I found as I went through here is there was several of the African American sites have survived and are kind of uh, in this particular part of New Jersey. There's the Titus Farm. This picture over here on the left is actually Cato Hoagland's house. And what happened was they moved it to uh, Piscataway and it's in the um, old town uh, houses there that are kind of been preserved. And that was actually the house that he lived in. On the bottom here is the Aaron Statz uh, cemetery, or cemetery stones in the old section of this one cemetery in Franklin Park. And this was um, the only African American in that old section. And so this whole area, I think, was the burying ground. And one of the things I'm working to see is if they can do penetrating radar to see if there's other graves in that area. This on the right, lower right is the gravestone of, um, of Aaron Hush the Civil War veteran. They actually, they were gonna come in this area and plow over the cemetery, but the uh, veterans said, no, this is an important uh, uh, grave, and so they've preserved it next to this development. One of the things in the book that I think is, is really interesting are the photographs I have on here. This guy, uh, Martin Garretson, a lot of the photos he took are pictures taken you know, in the 1890s, 1900s, early 1900s when a lot of people didn't take pictures. So these are really you know, unusual pictures. He ended up having a very interesting background as well. He's the man that saved the American buffalo. He was one of the people that was involved in that process and he ended up working for the Bronx Zoo for a number of years. Um, this photo on the upper right is an incredible photo. It's a turn of the century candid shot. Most photos during this time period were all posed. And this just looks just so natural. But that was like so unusual. And when I first saw it, I was like, and it was from a glass negative, and I'm like, wow, this is some picture, you know? And then the person on the bottom is the one who did my illustrations, Lauren Curtis. The, the Coleman family uh, comes in the latter, latter part of the book, and I went to meet with them, and I said, I wanted to get some pictures of your family. And they said, well, why do you want to include us in your book? And I said, because you're the happy ending. Because uh, what happens is they come in there and moved in in the 1920s during the Great Migration. Uh, after the Bakers had left uh, and sold the farm, uh, the new owner, Frank Morton, uh, he valued the, the black workers that came up that had experience in dairy farming. And so he sold land to them around his farm, and they ended up settling there. And these are some pictures of you know, their first house and uh, you know, different shots of them. And so they... Uh, they, uh, they, they were the first ones that come in there in the 1920s. Surviving buildings, one of the things, you come into a community like Franklin Park today and you realize that it's very much strip malls and gas stations and all that kind of stuff, but it was miraculous. Certain buildings still survive today. And as I went and researched the story, I was really happy to find some of these, like the one on the le upper left is the John J. Baker house, which is where that was Moore Baker's father's house. On the right is um, the home of the girlhood, the home that the victim lived as a girl growing up there, Lucretia. This was the store on the left, bottom left where the, the, the notices were put up concerning the expulsion, and that's Dr. Hoagland's office on the far, on the lower left. The theme of rejecting group blame for actions of individuals is something that I bring in the book is the fact that and we've seen this with the discussions lately of you know, different things with Tulsa and other, other areas where you have a perceived crime and then there's this massive uh, reaction that you know, just 
is completely unfair. And so one of the things I try to bring out in this book is that if people commit a crime, they should be brought to trial, there should be a civil way of handling it. Frontier justice is not something that America should do. And so that's one of the things that I bring out in the book. And then what I call the controversy. When I went to write the book, even my wife was mad at me because I didn't take a true stance one way or another. I, tr I created this book because I have respect for you, the readers, and I want you to read it and decide what the truth is. And so I spelled out all the evidence there. And um, the controversy is there. Some people, and I present their theories in there about what they think happened. Um, and uh, one of the things you need to determine as you read it is what really happened in that room that night. And the public response of, after I completed the book has been really very, uh, you know, endearing to me. Um, I found that diary entry, which was really great. Uh, Willard, I was at a book signing, and a descendant from Willard Thompson's family, one of the murder, supposed murderers, um, came up to me and said, in our family, Willard is this spot on our family tree that we feel a lot of sorrow. He died at 18 years old. And in our family, the belief was that he was killed by his boss because the boss thought he was having an affair with his wife. And I said, you know what? That puts a whole different twist on the story. Now it doesn't. <laughs> So um, another case came up where the victim's sister, Lucretia, her family contacted me and said, we always believed that Moore Baker did it. And I'm like, wow, the sister's family, you know? And I, that, was, that one really hit me. But the weird part was, I think there was a sense of that people couldn't break out of the, the relationships that were there. They couldn't just say, we don't believe in it, we're gonna like refute it. You know, it was like, it's, I just finished reading the book Cast, and I think in a way it was a caste system that was there and it was very hard for people to break out of it. And then Robert Mettler, who was um, the historian who's since passed, he told me that one of his per, uh, people in his church uh, came to him and said that they also had heard from their ancestor that they did not believe Moore Baker's version. And then what really got me was the inquest foreman's great-granddaughter came forward and said, in our family, we also believe that Moore Baker did it. So I was like, my God. Um, and then the one thing I was always looking for was a ghost story. And I have a great ghost story in the book, but I thought, this house where four murders took place in this room, there must have been haunted. And then after the book came out, somebody came forward and said, oh yeah, back in the uh, 70s, we stayed in that house and it was really haunted. I'm like, okay. So I guess with all that going on, something happened. And so I'm still waiting to find an actual picture of the house, because this house has always kind of fascinated me, the look of it, you know, and unfortunately it burned and nobody photographed it. So I'm just praying that somewhere out there, somebody will find a picture of the house for me. And then the question, did Willard Thompson and Henry Baker Pearson kill Lucretia Gertrude Baker on March 1st, 1894? I say read the book and decide, because I've tried to make it a very fair presentation um, you know, of what took place. And now, Franklin Park the movie. I Believe it or not, I have actually written a script for this, which I hope to, to, to uh, you know, mark it out there. So we'll see. I, in, the, in, the, in the script, I get a little bit more uh, truthful on my own feelings than in the book. Okay, here's my casting for it. I would cast a young Ed Norton as Moore Baker. For Lucretia Baker, Elizabeth Moss, I think fits her. They've already signed up. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I was trying to find a little girl that was kind of cute, so I got, you know, Aaron Murphy from Bewitched. And then for the, for the, the two men, I, I, I'd heard that Henry Baker was kind of this very jovial guy, because some of the descriptions that they have of people, that was one of the things that people said there was very off character for them to have done this murder because it wasn't their personalities. Um, and I have Laz Alonzo for Willard Thompson. He was like a kind of a tall, strong, uh, you know, uh, man. And then I thought that uh, Keenan Thompson for Henry Baker. And then for Maggie Miggins, it's got to be Regina King. She's got to be the one that's intense enough to, to, to meet the farmers and be surrounded by them and really, you know, tell them, no, I, I don't believe that my son uh, killed anybody. And for John J. Baker, Pierce Brosnan, he's kind of looking like the... <laughs> Soon in a theater near you. And that's, the, that's actually the grave uh, 
you know, for them. And what's really weird about the grave is both Lucretia and Gertrude are in the grave, and actually more Baker's buried there too. So it's kind of a bizarre mix, the grave. <laughs> so any, any questions anybody has? I'd like to uh, just say that for those of you who are listening from home, if you have any questions, um, you can write, write the, my cell phone number down. I'll give you my cell phone number, and you can text me a question. So the cell phone number is 678-654-9819. So please go ahead. Um, I'll say it again. 678 654 Five four nine eight one nine, and I'll give you a little time to send some texts, and we'll take some questions uh, from here in the sanctuary. Sure. How long did it take you to research all of this? Because we're broadcasting one. I need a mic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> how long did it take you to research all of this, and then how long did it take you to write it? Um, it took me about two years. Yeah, it was it was a lot of work, and the, what made it. Uh, a little easier is my office is only like about 15 minutes from where all the action took place. So I could go over there and I could kind of, you know, see different things. And um, so that made it a little easier logistically. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of work and a lot of newspapers. I can't tell you how many newspapers I, I reviewed. And there was just, uh, what I learned though, is it was kind of a, a lot of it, there was like a wire service. So a lot of the same stories traveled all through the U.S. And they'd end up in Ohio or in Arizona or wherever it was. It was pretty interesting. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yep. You discussed lynching in some of the slides, but were there actually lynchings going on in New Jersey uh, the w associated with that event? Um, the strange part about the lynching is there was talk at the time where people said that if the attackers had lived, that those farmers, those 500 farmers, w were wanted to lynch them. I mean, there, were, there was really the intent. They were, you know, they were very hot. Um, there was also an incident, which I talk about in the book, another story that of kind of, um, of interesting uh, thing that happened in Franklin Park, where there was a guy that supposedly uh, was at attacked this girl, and they actually were chasing him down, and the men wanted to lynch him but one of the residents grabbed him and brought him into the carriage and brought him to, j to, to jail. And he ended up getting three years in jail, not dead. So that was another example of why, you know, you gotta follow the justice. But yeah, I think there was a lot of close calls. And I don't know if I've really, if I've heard of any particular lynchings during this time period. I know earlier there were killings like in the 1700s and early 1800s. Um, but I don't know in this time period if there were lynchings. At least I haven't found any. So I had a question about the Baker name. I mean, Henry Baker Pearson, I, oh. I know you put in parentheses, um, one of the black victims. Yep. It, it, did you find out more about the story oh, yeah. of the name? Oh, yeah. It's all Was in the he... book. And, and what it is is... Oh, I have to read the book. Well, no, I'll tell you. Okay. I will explain it to you. What it is is... No, what the story is is that the Baker family were the slaveholders of Henry Baker's family. And so his mother was the daughter of Andrew Baker, who was a slave to um, Moore Baker's relative, you know, a few generations back. And so the reason why I call him Baker Pearson is that his one parent was Pearson and then his other parent was Baker. And sometimes people would call him Pearson out of disrespect, I thought, because they didn't want to call him Baker because they, you know, especially when they were talking about the murders, they didn't want to admit the relationship between them. The fact that they, and, and, and as I read through the whole thing, I was going, okay, now I understand what's going on. But I called him Henry Baker Pearson just to be consistent with the way the news accounts are. So if you went back and you looked at a, a clipping, sometimes it would say Henry Pearson, sometimes it would say Henry Baker. And that's why I did it. Yeah. Any more questions? I uh, read through the details of this prior to coming here tonight, oh, okay. and it, a very good presentation, by the way. Oh, thank you. And, uh, with, and I'll buy the book. And that's just one story of a million that you could talk about today. But I want to know, as you research this, and I research ancestry quite a bit and mm -hmm. have for years, yep. uh, family, both sides, all around, 
So I'm, inter I'm into the census and all the documents you can find and where they are and how they, how they read during different periods of time and how they were presented. How do you, how do you contrast you as a writer to that, that when you get into it and you get the feel for it with what we are today? As far as like where is with with racial issues and, and uh, the treatment of people and you and know all the weird that. part is sometimes I think we've progressed and sometimes I think we've gone back. You know, I mean it's like back. I mean, I mean it's just it's it's a mixed bag. I mean it's uh, I mean I have friends that you know who I actually talk about in in the in the opening that inspired me to to write this book. And they told me their stories that they experienced of racial, you know, injustice in the last 30 years. You know, so I mean, it's uh, I think it's still there. Uh, even when I hear people try to do things like I, re I heard a recent thing by Rand Paul saying that he believed that the, that him as a minority in the Senate is equivalent to uh, the minorities that fought Jim Crow laws. And I'm like, how does that? But I mean, it, there's a lot of strange things still going on. Uh, that, uh, that I you're, think you're going to get individuals. You'll never stamp that out. People are going to be people. But no. I mean, as a society in whole. Um, again, there's 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 a lot of progress going on. I mean, I think there's still a lot of work to to go. I mean, especially you know when things like law enforcement. I mean, I think there needs to be some improvement in other areas. But I think I think there's uh, you know is good and bad. I've, I've written some pieces on this and, and personal from yeah. my point of view, as yeah. you just did here. Yeah. And I can tell you, I'm 78, going to be 79. Yeah. So I've been around a while. Yep. I've seen some things. I've seen yep. the good and I've seen the bad. Yep. I have friends who played professional ball who weren't yep. allowed to stay with. Yep. I have a friend who was a catcher for Jim Palmer from the Orioles, and he tells me stories that are that would go along with yep. that. But that's not today. No. And so I think as bad as it, that is, and I yep. think as much can be improved. And I'm not going to say that's not yep. true. We are far from oh, yeah. what oh. could be what is being presented today oh, as definitely. we turn on the news. No, I, well, I'd agree. I'd agree that like I think areas there are certain areas that we need to focus on. You know, I think that that need to get fixed. You know, I mean, I think there. You know, there's the fear that African American parents have when their kids go out that they might not come back. I mean, that's something that I've talked to a lot of people on, and that's something we that probably we need to do better. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it was just a couple of years ago when I was in a workshop and someone, the leader of the workshop or the, the class or whatever it was, said, you all know what the 10 and 2 position is, right? I went, yeah, you know, that's what you're learning. He said, that's what I taught my son who was adopted and was a black child. Uh, about how to stay safe if he's stopped by the police. And I think back to 1956 or 57 when those little girls were being, and children were being escorted. And it's so, it's devastating to me to think that we're not farther than we are at this point all these years later. Yep. And I think that um, one, of the, one of the profound things to me about the George Floyd murder was that people all over witnessed it. Yep. And that I believe that the majority of people really want to see equality of not only opportunity, but just a recognition of your life is as valuable as mine. Yep. And that um, hopefully we're, we're going to be moving at much, much more in, in the right direction. Yep. But. Thank you. We have a texted question from uh, Melissa Feeney. Um, she says, besides an alleged affair, what are some other motives that have been unearthed for the husband to kill his wife and child? Um, it's, there's been a, an idea that the, the ride to Dayton was involved with a sale of a horse and that there might have been an argument between the wife and Moore Baker over him doing that action uh, and that the horse was actually stolen from 
um, another uh, resident there that was a very affluent resident. That's the one that sued him. So that's one theory is that there's the possibility that there might have been something like that. And also that Moore Baker had a bit of a reputation as a drinker, much more than the two attackers, although they were accused of getting drunk to do it. And that was one of the reasons they said with Willard Thompson, who was a very passive guy. And in the newspaper, they even said he was the kind of guy that couldn't even kill a chicken. Yet he supposedly murdered a, a, a young child and, and the mother. So that was um, one of the theories that's out there. You know, there's the possibility that there was some kind of fight between the, the wife and that when Moore Baker went out of hand, he, you know, sometimes people do more than they intended to do. You know, a, a you know, crime of passion. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I haven't seen you guys in so long. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really just have a comment, I guess. Okay. Um, and give me a minute, because I want it to make sense. Because um, initially, this is kind of emotional for me. And not just because of, you know, because I'm black, but because I, I kind of really understand this. And I, I guess from, I can only speak for myself. Because, you know, just like they say, you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism, well, you met one black person, you just met one black person. Yeah. So I can say for myself is the thing that I haven't seen change is, is that everyone deserves their moment in, of justice. And that is the problem. Yep. The issue with a lot of the murders that you see, the first thing that you see is the media saying how bad the person was. And I'm not saying that the person may not have been bad, but they still deserve their day in court. Yep. And it shouldn't end in them dying. That's it. Yep. And one of the things that bothers me about that is because there was a day when I could have been that person. And most of you know me, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't hurt anybody. But I, um, I, had, I was living in Philadelphia and I was, um, I was with my ex-husband, well, one of my ex-husbands, I've had a lot, and um, he was very, abusive and he called the police and then I thought everything was over and then he came to my job with the restraining order mm. and when you get a restraining order you can't go back to your home but my kids were in there and he was horribly abusive so I went anyway and did I resist when the police told me to leave I did I did because my kids were in there that could have been me that could have been that moment where I was being disrespectful and something happened. It didn't, and I'm glad that it didn't, but that's all it takes, apparently, is resisting. Yeah. I left, but again, most of you that know me now also know my son, and he suffered a lot because of that, because his dad was very abusive. And the point was, is that sometimes you just need your day. And if they would have arrested me, I would have left and then that was it. But what about when that doesn't happen? And when we see this story, it's like, you know, there were 15 minutes and then that's it. That's what happened. These guys came in and they murdered these people and that's it. Yep. But we don't know if that's what happened. But that's what it is. And these people are tainted forever. Maybe, maybe they were working that day. Maybe the husband did want to kill his wife and his child, and he did, and blamed it on the two colored people that was there. Yep. Stuff like that happened all the time. Oh, yeah. But we will never know that because that's what he said, and his word is it. Yep. And when, the thing that bothers me, again, about all the killings is, is that if these people did what they did, and so, some of them did, like selling the cigarettes or whatever, they could have easily just went to jail, mm -hmm. or they could have taken them to jail, they could have had their day in court, and that was it. Yep. but they're six feet under. Yep. And the last thing that I wanted to say was that, you know, we see these things happen all the time, and the reason why people get so upset is because that didn't happen. But then you see, like, the massacres in church, or, you know, when it happens and it's not a black person, and their day in court comes. Yep. So I guess all we're really looking for is that same day in court, if that makes sense. Yep. That was it. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to mention something. My, um, my daughter, I, I have two adopted children, uh, both from Central America, and 
my one daughter, uh, she's a little spirited, and uh, she had an incident with a, a traffic incident, um, and they ended up giving her like six tickets. And I've always wondered whether if she was blue-eyed blue and blonde, if she would have gotten six tickets. Uh, it, it just has always crossed my mind, is, uh, which is a common thing that happens too, is the overcharging of people. Too. Any other questions? Not a question, just a thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, just the one thing for me is the just teaching people kind of how the whole slavery issue and how people were that were living here were from, born here and then people came here. I mean, I never learned any of that. I mean, it was, you know, you just get a whole different dynamic on what was going on. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. I mean, I, I like that part of history, the stuff that's, uh, that's not really told, you know, so, yeah. It does need to be told. Are there any more questions? Any, any from uh, folks online? I don't think so. We had the one question from Melissa. Okay. Well, I, um, I'm trying to absorb the whole story right now. And yes, I want, I want to buy the book. So okay. Brian, thank you so much. Sure. I think we should uh, give Brian a great round of applause. This has been a great discussion. Um, and uh, we do have copies of the book, I, and they can be signed if they're not. I need to get a couple myself. Um, I think Kate wants one. Um, and while we're uh, thinking about whether we want a book or not, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, we're coming up on uh, Juneteenth, and uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Juneteenth. Right. How many of you? didn't hear of Juneteenth until, oh, say, the past five years. Right, so we all learned about it in the past five years or even more recent than that, myself included. So Juneteenth um, is actually a, a, a misnomer. Uh, it's, it's June 19th, but it's celebrated as Juneteenth, and it is indeed celebrated because two years after the Emancipation Proclamation um, and two years after the federal government declared that all black people in our country were free, um, they were still being enslaved in Texas. And the Union Army sent, um, went to Galveston and told the black people there, the slaves there, that they were free. So for two years after the federal government um, freed them, they finally got their freedom on June 19th in Galveston, Texas, and uh, so that's why Juneteenth is such a great celebration. So, there are a couple things, there are a lot of things going on. <laughs> uh, Juneteenth ha happens to be this coming Saturday. Um, Max has brought it to my attention that the African American Museum in Philadelphia is doing an all day outdoor event that's open to the public. Um, and I think in the museum itself, they're featuring an artist who you may want to go see. I see lots of heads nodding, so if anybody wants to add anything pertinent, please let me know and I'll let you speak. The exhibit is free that day. Um, and then this Saturday, right here in Morristown, in Perkins Park, uh, there's a Juneteenth celebration from 10 to 2. Bring your own blankets and good food to eat and something to drink. Um, and there's going to be a celebration of Juneteenth right here in Morristown this Saturday. Um, is there anything else we'd like to cover? Pastor Eric. Okay, uh, June, here, I'll, I'll let Pastor Eric say that. Sure. Um, June 17th, later this week, is um, the commemoration of the Emanuel Nine, those who were killed in Charleston at the church. That is officially a commemoration of the ALCA um, to remember that murder as well. Thank you. You know, I actually worked with somebody whose 
mother was a member of that church and was supposed to be there in that church when it happened, and she got stuck and was late going to the church for that, for that evening. So um, this was a woman that I worked with uh, at, at TD Bank. Um, so anyway, I don't know if uh, there's anything else we want to add, but I had a great evening. This has been a lot of, uh, I don't want to say fun, but it's been very interesting, and it has been enlightening. Um, I can't imagine how many more stories there are like this that we don't know. And so we appreciate the work that you did, because this is your side gig, right? I mean, you have a, <laughs> a full-time job as well, so. There's a lot of really interesting books out there, um, you know, about topics like sundown towns and expulsions. And I, I read a, quite a number of them to, to write this book, because I figured I couldn't write it until I really kind of immersed myself in it. So I, I really you know, recommend people to read those books as well because it's really startling how many expulsions took place across the US and, and a number of them within the 20th century. Thanks, um, in fact, I can, if you have a, a biography that you would like to share with me, I can share it with the, um, with the other resources that we gather because I have a spreadsheet with a bunch of stuff in it which is, can, I just add on to the bottom of it. So I think that's it for our event unless there's anything else. I don't want to rush the conversation, it's been a very, very good evening, and I'm excited to, uh, to do another one, to have more conversations like this with more people in our community. So thank you very much. Max just, Max just loves to stay, nope, that's it. It's just the one, but to you on, on, on YouTube, thank you so much for dialing in. How many did we have? Up to 16, but an average of nine. So that's great. We had a great. Right. <laughs> we'll just call them people. <laughs> Thank you very much.